Six weeks ago, the 2018 crop of maize was drilled in Lincolnshire fields. It's our starting point for a journey through the biogas process. From renewable feedstock helping to improve farm productivity and profitability, all the way to energy for the home. By late September, the feedstock will be ready for harvest and delivery to site, where it is covered and stored, ready for use all year round. This plant makes enough gas for over 3,000 households in the deepest winter and well over 10 times as many in the summer months. Fed daily through a fully automated hopper, the feedstock is digested in the absence of oxygen, producing a steady and reliable flow of biogas. The tanks are stirred continuously and the biology is carefully regulated to maximise output. Computer controlled, remotely monitored and integrated into the national grid, the plant produces its storable, dispatchable energy ready to heat homes come rain or shine. Once cleaned and upgraded through a system of membranes, the biomethane is metered and injected into the local gas grid for use by consumers in the home, in industry and transport. To complete the circle, the spent feedstock is returned to the field as a valuable organic fertilizer, ready to start the process afresh. This slide uh, is really why we're excited about the AD sector. Um, so there is a demonstrable pipeline of assets coming through, and it's certainly material to uh, a fund such as JLIN. The Trade Association ADBA estimate that around 2 billion of assets have been built, and uh, we can see that a, a significant chunk of that capital has been provided by the tax advantage funds, so VCT funds, EIS funds. Those funds, as you'll know, uh, have a tax holding period of three years, uh, and then typically they'll be seeking an exit. Uh, so that means that any assets that come through this route uh, will already have an established uh, operating track record uh, and will be able to see how they uh, work in steady state. We've transacted with a number of these funds already, so we are a good partner for these funds as the, uh, as the assets come out. Uh, now, we're unlikely to be interested in all the assets built, uh, and these graphs here uh, just show the, the different uh, sizes. So on the left here, uh, gas to electricity, on the right, uh, gas to grid. We will be only really interested in the larger plants. Uh, so they're the ones with sufficient scale to support the level of management cost, really, that we think is necessary to make sure that they're uh, investable for a fund such as JLN. Also, these graphs show that a range of feedstocks are used. This presentation is about agricultural AD, so crop AD. That is something that we are comfortable with. Uh, we understand the risk profile and how to manage it. Uh, that's not to say that in the future we might uh, not look at other forms of AD, uh, particularly municipal and commercial waste, given the, um, the skills within the, the fund as a whole. But it is a different uh, proposition. Uh, it has different risks, and we would seek to ma manage those uh, risks differently. Uh, and if that's something that interests you, I would encourage you to talk to Mr. Holmes, who has uh, smelt more of these kinds of plants than he cares to remember in the, in the past. Um, we are interested in both gas to electricity and gas to grid plants. So far, our investments have been in gas to grid. 
Just to note uh, an interesting aside on gas to grid. Um, so some of you will know that uh, the UK's 2020 renewable energy targets feature not only the electricity generation elements, which were on target to meet in large part through the deployment of wind and solar, um, but also uh, heat and transport fuel elements as well. Uh, and these are aspects that uh, green gas is able to contribute to. I think it's interesting that uh, a subsidy window has reopened uh, for renewable heat uh, at a time when all other subsidy windows tend to be closing or are already closed. These projects enjoy a large degree of subsidy support. You can see from this chart here, um, a typical gas to grid project with three or four years worth of operating history behind it can uh, expect to receive um, subsidies through the renewable heat incentive, feed-in tariff for uh, renewable electricity generated and consumed on site, and green gas certificates. So together, making up over 80% of the project's revenues. And if you can compare that to solar, a solar farm of similar vintage, credited around 2014, 2015, they can expect uh, a subsidy element of around 56%, and for onshore wind, a subsidy of around 50% of their overall revenue makeup. So quite a, a compelling picture there, we think. And those cash flows are RPI linked. So this aids our current dividend policy of maintaining uh, increases uh, broadly in line with inflation. I thought it'd be helpful to have a quick recap on the renewable heat incentive. Um, some of you may not be so familiar with it. It remains the government's main support mechanism to encourage renewable energy other than electricity. So producers of renewable heat, biogas or biomethane can expect to receive support through the subsidy regime. Um, it lasts for 20 years. Payments are made on a quarterly basis from Ofgem, indexed either at RPI or by CPI, depending on when you're accredited. And importantly, um, they offer grandfathering as well. So notwithstanding the, the digression that we've seen uh, in tariffs with RHI, as we have seen with, with other support mechanisms, um, the government will honour their original tariffs that they are credited on. So when we are acquiring plants with a four or five year track record, we can certainly expect to receive the same tariff as when they originally accredited. So you shouldn't really see the RHI as any different, carrying any more risk than you would do with rocks or with FITs. Another great attraction of the sector is the ability to do things with the plants, to increase value with the asset that you own. And this can come in a number of ways. On a day-to-day -day basis, looking at production, um, uh, making sure that you have efficient production for the feedstock that you, um, you take in. And this should be happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have uh, incentive mechanisms with our AD operators to encourage outperformance against base case. We can invest in minor capital works. This is a rotor grinder at the Igneo plant. It's a nifty little video. When I asked for it, the, the, the operator nipped out with his mobile phone, videoed it, and sent it over on WhatsApp, which uh, I thought was quite neat. But uh, here you can see um, that the rotor grinder is literally grinding up the silage, um, making it easily digestible, uh, increasing gas yield per ton of feedstock. So quite a simple piece of kit. We're actually projecting a payback period of less than a year on this. Um, and something which um, we can certainly look at um, across a few plants. We can look at major CapEx upgrades. And in fact, we're looking at this on one of our assets, um, the Vulcan asset, where um, uh, circumstances dictate that we have the ability to significantly increase our output of that project. And then lastly, um, we can look at financial structuring. So uh, these projects, as Chris mentioned, have typically been financed by EIS and VCT capital. Um, often unlevered, they're quite small in nature um, and don't lend themselves naturally to project finance. But when you build up a portfolio, as we are clearly intending to do, then that brings with it the option to introduce leverage on a portfolio scale. Um, and by doing so, that will release capital that we might be able to employ um, for the capital works I've just talked you through, uh, and also increasing the return on our original investment case. So it's something which we're exploring, and we've had some initial discussions with lenders in the market. They seem quite keen to offer a product um, uh, to uh, uh, cover that area, uh, and we'll monitor that as we go on. AD risk management can be split into four key areas. And certainly what I'm going to be speaking to about now is these are not limited to just these areas, but the, uh, these are the sort of key ones. 
And the, the key risk management areas are revenue, cost, um, the supply chain, and regulatory. I'll be talking a bit about those uh, individually. So in terms of managing risks in terms of revenue, um, and that's all about sort of making sure that you're optimizing your uptime and, uh, and managing your planned uh, and unplanned downtime. And that could be through incentivization schemes with the counterparties. But it doesn't just stop there. It's actually understanding that those counterparties, can they actually deliver that? And that comes with experience of, of knowing the industry. Um, in terms of cost, Feedstock um, accounts towards one of the largest operational costs in anaerobic digestion. So maximizing that feedstock quality whilst making sure those costs are managed is, is imperative. And putting the right systems in place as investment managers to make sure that, that those risks are mitigated is also important. Choosing the right technology. Although technology risk is, is low, um, the, the, the common phrase of high capex up front, low opex uh, later on is, is true for anaerobic digestion as it is for any other process industry. Um, so understanding what are those better technologies out there that offer more reliability it is important. Um, in terms of the supply chain, I'll just touch upon this briefly. Um, I, prior to joining uh, JLCM, I undertook a, an industry-wide uh, O&M tender exercise for a, for a large two and a half megawatt plant, and got some really good results. Um, got a, got a, we managed to get a lot of uh, interest in, in the tender, and that's something that would is unheard of a couple of years ago. And that's a testament to show that the industry has developed itself in terms of operations. Regulatory health and safety is paramount in the sector. It's, a, it's an industrial process um, linking agricultural practices and as investment managers, making sure that we've got the right systems in place to, make sure, to ensure that the, the plants have been operated um, compliantly. What we've done over the period, along with deploying around about £120 million of, um, as Chris says, largely EIS and VCT monies uh, with a little bit of uh, IHT debt funding in some of these projects, uh, from the EIS and VCT providers, um, is build an expert team around uh, the operation of these plants. So we have um, about 30 operators. We've got a, a, a three microbiologists in our own in-house lab. We've got an engineering team of, um, of 18, 20 people who can service everything from the gas upgrade and CHP all the way back through the AD plant to the feed hoppers and so on and so forth. This is our Grange farm plant. And what you've got on the top left-hand corner there is the silage clamp, um, something that's uh, very familiar to anybody who's ever been to a dairy farm. It's how you store silage in, in a big pile under plastic uh, during the, um, during the uh, outside of the growing season or outside of harvest. So on those three clamps will be, at some point in the year, almost all of the feedstock required to run that asset for a year. It's come in at harvest. It's, it's uh, laid down there, it's, it's rolled, it's sheeted, it's preserved, and then it's fed over the year into the feed hopper, and the feed hopper in turn draws it automatically on a 24-7 basis into the plant where it will ferment, and those of you who are paying attention will have seen the bit of the bubbling bit, which looked a bit like a nasty brown porridgey soup. That's the content of the fermenters. It stays in there on average for about 60 days, and in that time, a, a very, uh, a, a, a very well-known microbiological process breaks it down. It's the same process that happens in the rumen of a cow. It's the same process that happens in, uh, in uh, swamps and so forth. In this case, we are harnessing it and industrializing it, if you like. Um, and the gas that comes off it is then sent to an upgrader that you also saw um, and a, a gas engine, a CHP. So we make our own heat, which goes to answering the question we just had, on site to, uh, to heat the fermenters in the winter. Having said that, most of the reaction is actually exothermic, so we don't actually need to add very much heat to it. It's just, if you have a winter like the one we just did have, then yes, there is. I mean, apart from the fact that the operators struggle to get to the plants sometimes and actually feed the plants, but leaving that aside, um, there is a little bit of a heat requirement, and that's dealt with by a gas engine on site that also provides all the electricity to run the site, uh, and that runs the gas upgrade equipment, and that is fit accredited, so we're getting paid a tariff to use electricity that we've made ourselves. The nice thing about AD as far as farming is concerned is that all of the goodness goes back on the field. So we split our digestate into a solid and a liquid fraction. Ines will tell you a little more about that in a moment. Um, but all of that goes straight out onto fields and it's actually qualified as an organic fertilizer. So it's, it's quite attractive to a variety of organic growers and everybody else. Um, it has, if you like, not just the, the fertilizer components, it also has a wider balance of uh, trace elements and so forth. So it is 
uh, a little bit like rocket fuel. And then the whole thing's rounded off with an office and a Weybridge uh, where everything is controlled on the way in and the way out. The main point about our feedstock and digestic management um, is that it's local. We don't sit in an ivory tower somewhere with a large spreadsheet just expecting feedstock to come to us. Um, we work very much with uh, a, 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 an increasing group of, of local farmers who we want to supply uh, into our plants and we want uh, to supply them with digestate in return. Uh, so just for an idea of scale, the Vulcan plant has been alluded to earlier and that, that green diamond in the middle of that red circle um, is, is the location of the Vulcan plant. Now that, that red circle is approximately 10 miles. So it's feasible to take feedstock from 10 miles. Most of what we take is about five miles. Most of the, the majority of feedstock that we bring in is about from, from about five miles. But if you take that 10 mile radius as your extreme, there's about 80,000 hectares in there. It's not all farmland. There's a nature reserve there. There's Doncaster, another sort of nature reserve perhaps. There's uh, a number of different uh, villages, roads, such like. But effectively, that, that, that green diamond is effectively the land mass that we would need to take each year to get the amount of feedstock into the plant that we want. So our overall impact locally is about 2% of a local land bank. I, I, I'm firmly of the opinion that, that AD cropping is sustainable. Um, this uh, rather uh, poor cow in the cartoon um, kind of sums up um, the, the first point that unlike many other crops, we, the, the crops that we produce for AD um, have to meet a criteria and we have to prove that criteria uh, to Ofgem before we get uh, money from them. So in terms of how the crop has been grown, um, how sustainable is it, how much nitrogen fertilizer has it has, how far has it traveled, um, and, and how well has it been stored, uh, how well has it been used through the whole AD process. So the whole efficiency of what we do is being monitored. Um, it's, it's been monitored by uh, Ofgem to meet targets set by DEFRA. So we're kind of answerable already to the, to the guys that are setting the targets. Um, but also there's the, the other bit that AD does, um, which is the benefits it can bring from a farming point of view to areas of the country where we, we've moved into, if you like. So we've gone to Norfolk on light soils where there was very short cropping rotations, which was wheat, nosseed rape, and nothing very exciting about it. Very little livestock in those areas. So depletion of organic matter in soils. And we were able to sort of bring a little bit of life back to that rotation, bring new options. Um, and we're seeing good results uh, where we've introduced digestate and such like back to soils with cover crops to show sugar beet yields are, are increasing and such as well. So it's not just about grow for AD and, and get a good price for your crop. It's about the other benefits that increasing your rotation are going to bring.